We, something we started beginning here, the life and teachings of Paul in chronological order. And uh, so if you're, you're King James Bible, uh, thank you, no, Jerry, it was, it, those aren't, they didn't have the, the uh, spot TV lights on. Hallelujah. Um, we're teaching on the life and teachings of Paul, life and writings of Paul in chronological order. And um, we're doing a, so your King James Bible has his writings in uh, the way they did the canon of the Bible, uh, in English at least, is they took the longest letter to the shortest letter and did the letters to the churches and then did his personal letters right after that in the same format, longest to shortest. But that's not chronological. Uh, they chronologically were written. Uh, we know that, that First Thessalonians was the first letter that Paul wrote. And so we're doing a study through the book of Acts. And wherever Paul is when he wrote a letter, we stop, leave him there, and go study the book he wrote. All right? So we're in 1 Corinthians right now. He's left. We're waiting for our map to get up. I want to point. I got my little laser pointer thing there. Hallelujah. And we're going to find out that Paul has been left at Ephesus on the third missionary journey. Uh, his fourth missionary journey is when he ends up in prison. And uh, so we, we're, not, we're, we're going to get to the prison epistles eventually. And that'll be good because the things he writes from prison is really good. And, uh, but we started a couple weeks ago on 1 Corinthians, studying the letter. We've talked about the background of 1 Corinthians. Uh, the church of Corinth was a very carnal church. Everybody say carnal. Now, how many understand carnal means fleshly? Okay, it's, it's talking about people, carnal Christians are not spiritual Christians. They may be Christians, they may love God, may be going to heaven, but they're not very spiritual. Their flesh dictates what they do. Their flesh governs them. Uh, you know, their, ap their fleshly appetites tell them what to do. And the Corinthian church was extremely fleshly church, okay? And uh, at a very extremely fleshly time. And uh, they just kind of, whatever, whatever felt good, do it. You know, they just kind of had all these opinions about stuff. And Paul's first Corinthians, I believe, is probably the most corrective letter he wrote. Um, very strong. Um, you know, today we have a lot of people teaching a lot of things under the guise of it doesn't matter, you know, somehow or another that if, if you love God, it just doesn't matter what you do with your body. And of course, last week we read where Paul said, you know, that there was a price paid for your body, therefore glorify God with your body and your spirit, which are God's. Amen. So it means that God does care what you do with your body. Dick, I'm a little hot in the house for some reason tonight. I'm not sure why, but it's, it's pretty hot. Not the temperature, the, uh, <laughs> the mic. Is that better on y'all? Because it was kind of ringing in my ears. It was too loud. Okay. All right. Let's get to the slide where it says Paul's, uh, Paul's third and fourth journeys. Hallelujah. And so we know that Paul's been on his third journey. He's been traveling around. Uh, here we go. Uh, the third mission journey started in Antioch, goes through Tyre, Sir, uh, Deborah, Iconium, Antioch. This Antioch, that same Antioch is over here. Um, and, and he's at Ephesus. And while he's sitting up here in Ephesus, uh, he, he has, um, of course, we did this a couple weeks ago, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, I believe verse 9 tells us that Paul said, I wrote to you before in an epistle, or a letter, the word epistle is, is the key Jimmy era word for letter, uh, not to company with fornicators. Now what he said there, what we, we, after that particular verse was this, Paul apparently wrote a letter before 1 Corinthians to the church at Corinth. And it was a letter talking about stuff that's going on over there. They didn't receive it real well. And so he's written the second, this other letter we, we call 1 Corinthians. Obviously, we don't have the other letter, uh, or it would probably be in the Bible, but we don't have it. So this is referred to as 1 Corinthians. Probably was the second letter he wrote to that church. Okay? And, um, and so he, he comes back because there's just so many, he's, he's getting reports. Timothy has gone over there, and they've come back over, they've talked to him. Now, remember, he's over here at Ephesus. Now, he's getting ready to leave Ephesus, and before he leaves, he writes what we refer to as 1 Corinthians. And in that letter, because there begins a lot of correction, a lot of things about their, you know, flesh. Now, I lo love it, though, 1 Corinthians, in chapter 1, he talks about you come behind and no gift. You know, he just says, you know, you guys are great, you love the God, you guys zeal for the things of God, then bam, but you are carnal. Hello. <laughs> I mean, you know, you, see, you one says I'm of Paul, one says I'm of Apollos, one says I'm of Cephas or Peter. Cephas was, was another name for Peter. And, uh, you know, they had had fractions and, and sections in the church, and uh, he, he kind of rebuked them for it. Okay? There's a lot of rebuking in this letter. Yeah. Hallelujah. Then they found out that one guy's in there living with his stepmama, took his stepmama away from his daddy and just come to church like it was normal. And Paul said, look, look, guys, I mean, the Gentiles don't even do this, you know? The heathen don't even do this. I mean, and they're pretty bad over there, and you're doing, they don't even do this. And so he, he, he turns that guy over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, that his spirit will be saved in the day of the Lord. Hallelujah. All right, let's go on down now to the, uh, the, the last slide. <clears throat> so Paul dealt with in 1 Corinthians chapters 1 through 2, divisions in the church. 
I mean, not through chapter 4, divisions in the church. Then chapter 5, discipline, he deals with the man who's living with his stepmother. And then in chapter 6, um, he, verses 1 through 8, he deals with how Christians shouldn't be going to the, the, to the world court to settle disputes within the church. We should be dealing with those things. Okay? And then he, he goes to talk about being not, then he gets into the last part of that sixth chapter, talks about men being defiled by the world. Now, I, I tell you, more and more we come up in the church that people are trying to live as much like the world as they can live and get away with it. That's never the intent of the kingdom of God. We are the standard setter. We're not to reduce to the lowest, you know, how many of this, that, you know, if you, if you build a, a chain link, or if you're, if you're, let's say if you put an anchor on a, on a Navy ship, okay, every single links for those, those things, those chain, I mean, they're, they're huge, they're huge, they're, the, the link's like this big around, and the, the link itself is, you know, they're just huge, massive, but if you've got one of those links this week, something's not right with it, guess what, the entire chain of those links is only as strong as that weakest one. So you can have massive, I mean, you know, reinforced, hardened steel and have one that's not right. And it will, it, it will mess up the whole thing. Because if it, if it fails, the whole thing fails. You drop the anchor and one link fails, the anchor goes to the bottom and you don't stop the ship. It doesn't, it just, okay? And see, God never intended for the church to have weak, weak links. We're not trying to reduce, so in other words, the strength is only as strong as the weakest part. So it is, the, it is the, the purpose of the church to develop the believer, to grow the believer, to bring the believer up so that every part is strong. Amen? We're not trying to become as weak as we can get so that we can, you know, marginally be different from the world and get people to come in. We're to be strong enough and so strong that we can bring them in and bring them up to that higher standard, which is walking with God. All right, so we talked about defilement with the world. You have to go back and listen to those on YouTube uh, or on our website. And then he got it. Then Paul goes into chapter 7, which was where we were last week. And he says, basically, I won't paraphrase this just a little bit because I'm not going to quote the actual verse. He says, now, you guys wrote, wrote me a letter and asked me some questions. Now, concerning virgins, and you know, sometimes virgins can refer to unmarried daughters, all right? Um, and so he, he, he just spends the seventh chapter talking about marriage whether people should be married, to understand he makes a very strong statement. See, when I first went to Raymond back in 1980, graduated in 81 uh, out there in Tulsa, <clears throat> they told us about a group of guys who had been in Raymond back in like 78 or so, and they were all, these are all these guys got together. It's amazing how dumb we can get when we get to be Christians. And we don't need to be dumb to be a Christian. But all these guys got together, and they formed the Burr Club. Bachelors until rapture. Every one of them are married. <laughs> you know, bachelors until rapture. Oh, you know, because Paul says, I would you be like me and not be married. Read the seventh chapter. He says this. And one of the things he says in there is, for this present distress. In other words, you know, we're in difficult times. There's some things going on in the world. There's things going on socially in the world. And as a Christian, you're going to face some hardships. And then he talks about the fact that, you know, he that is married to the Lord or, or serving God cares only about the things of God. He that's married cares about the things of his wife. Okay? And so he's saying under this present distress, the qualifier for a lot of those things he said was, you know, just what's going on in the world right now, it's, it's just difficult to get married and be a Christian because of the persecution, because of all the stuff going on, that kind of stuff. It wasn't a doctrinal thing that we should all be unmarried. Right. Hence, no reproduction. Right. <laughs> not biblically anyway. Okay? Because if you're all reproducing, you're not, you're, you know, you're getting in trouble. You know, when God don't want you in trouble. God, God wants you to go on. Amen. Isn't that right? Yeah. Hallelujah. Well, well, you know, what happens if, you know, you know of course, we, we, we'll get to some things other, other on, on the, later on in some other letters about what we do when we miss the mark and we do sin, what, you know, what coverage. God has good coverage for you. God's got a, God's got a rest restoration plan for you. Amen? Amen? All right. So anyway, you know, that stuff set in chapter 7, he answered those questions. And in one place, he says, now, I think, you know, really, I think God didn't say this. This is kind of my opinion. And that's what, you know, I have to read kind of through the King James, if you're reading King James. Uh, sometimes he word, they word stuff that's a little archaic for us now. All right, so now we're into chapter 8, and, what he, and we can turn the heat off. Dear Lord. It was a little chilly when we got in here, but it does not take this system long to get hot. Get, uh, did uh, somebody want to get me some? Yeah. That's where you go, Jesse. All right. <coughs> All right. 
Now, Paul writes and talks about, you know, he begins to, <laughs> no wonder I, wouldn't, I couldn't find, I was trying to look for a certain wor worded, wording, but I was in 2 Corinthians, it wasn't in there. Okay. Now, chapter 7, verse 1 of 1 Corinthians says this, Now concerning whereof, the things whereof you wrote unto me, and then you know, he goes on. Paul begins to answer some questions that they had. Okay, starts in chapter 7, goes through the end of chapter 10. Chapter 11, he moves on to some other things like how the Lord's table, Lord's table is supposed to be conducted. Okay, but chapter 7, 8, 9, and 10 are answers to questions from a letter that the church at Corinth sent to him over in Ephesus. And again, that wasn't that very far. It was just across the little, the little straight there. Hallelujah. And so we dealt with chapter 7 last week. Let's get into chapter 8 because, you know, again, these are answers to questions. Okay? He says, now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that all have knowledge. And but now, that's, let me, now King James can say this a little funny sometimes. He said, you already know this. Raymond says something on the line, you already know this. You know, uh, we all have knowledge, but knowledge puffs up. Love edifies. In other words, let, let, don't think you know everything and get puffed up about it. Now, that's one of the things we deal with in the church today, particularly... Um, with some of the stuff that's going on, people think they got the grip on the whole world, and they're, they're the, you know, somebody was, writing, somebody was writing a blog today about some stuff that's going on, and, you know, they, they accused the church, the other people being, you know, thinking they had all the answers, and this guy just slam blasting like he has all the answers. I'm like, you know, thou that judgest, none that doest thou sin. That's where that hypocritical judgment comes in, okay? Matthew 7, 1 is a hypocritical judgment, not judgment. You go study out a little bit better, you'll get the idea. Because, you know, how many, how many know that Jesus told them, once you got the beam out, you can judge the other guy? Yeah. Okay. So it can't just mean you can't, it's a blanket statement. You can't ever judge anything. As a matter of fact, we're told to judge throughout the, the epistles. Yeah. Not judgmental in the sense that you're, you know, oh, yeah, look at them. I mean, that's not judgment. That's not biblical judgment. Yeah. Right. Biblical judgment is, has an end to restoration. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. In other words, when you see wrong and you judge that it's wrong, according to the word, not to your opinion, but according to the word, and it's judged wrong, the purpose is to bring restoration, not to kill them. Yeah. Now, the hypocritical judgment was the guys who caught the woman in the act of adultery in the very act. Yeah. Remember her? Y'all yeah, remember the woman who got caught in adultery in the very act? They brought her. Where was the guy she got caught in the act with? Right. 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 They left him out. Why? Because they probably think he was a Pharisee or a Sadducee. He was one of, he was one of the members. And they, were, they were covering up for him going to kill the woman. Yeah, anyway, that's hypocritical. That's the judgment Jesus is referring to. That's a hypocritical judgment. All right. So chapter 8, he starts out, Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up. Now, yeah, listen again. But love edifies. All knowledge has to be tempered with love. And if any man think he knoweth anything, he knoweth not yet as he ought to know. In other words, uh, you may think you've got a grip on everything, but your knowledge is so, you made you so arrogant that you really don't know. Knowledge that's not tempered by love is not true knowledge. Amen. <clears throat> um, and so Paul says here, you may think you know something, but if, you don't, if, if you're really that puffed up about it, you really don't have the right kind of knowledge anyway. Now, if any man love God, the same is known of him. Again, we come back to the love of God. We, we are born of the love of God. The love of God has been shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost. So like I said, you know, remember Paul wrote to the church at Galatia and said, Brethren, if you see a brother overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, lest ye be tempted likewise. Now, how can you see him overtaken in a fault if you don't judge it? Right. But see, here's the tempering factor. <coughs> ye which are spiritual, restore him in the spirit of meekness. In other words, the love of God can governs how you, how you deal with that action on their part and not you know, you're better than them. See, hypocritical judgment is the Pharisee standing and beating his chest saying, I pray three times a day and I fast often and I do all this, you know, and then the man's down there weeping and saying, you know, forgive me, I'm a sinner. You know, I'm, I'm not like this guy. I'm better than him. That's hypocritical judgment. God don't like that. And here he says, uh, if any man love God, the same is known of him. Now, as therefore the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in this world and that there is none other God but one. Now, here we come. We're going to talk about spiritual people 
who are mature in God, who understand that if I eat this T-bone steak, it don't matter because that thing ain't a real idol in the first place. Okay? Now, he's, now he's, he's establishing the fact that, we, that the, the, the people who understand that know that. That's not going to be the end of his discourse, though. Okay? Now, you may go in there and go, look, there's only one God. You, you say you offer this to, the, the, to, the, the, to the, the swine God, and I'm going to have Eastern Carolina barbecue that you offer to the swine God. How many, how many have you ever been down east? Yeah, that's where I'm from. Hallelujah. I mean, vinegar-based, Eastern-style barbecue. Make you shout. Hallelujah. Mm. Some of you all are drooling about it, just thinking about it, don't you? Hallelujah. Because you've had mine. Okay. For though that there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or earth, as there, may, uh, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and the one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Now, stop right there. Don't, don't read on. Paul's saying that there are people who have come to the understanding and have the knowledge and the understanding that, you know, you can call this a food offered to a swine God. It's not going to affect me because I know there's only one God. Okay? But he didn't stop. And this is where people get in trouble. Well, I know it doesn't mean anything. Yeah, you may know it doesn't mean anything. You know, and if you were at home in private and nobody was watching it and you were, you were eating food off to the swine guy, that don't mean you can go smoke dope. That's not, that's not the question here. See, you can't take stuff from right. You've got Christians now thinking it's all right to smoke dope. Well, it's, it's the herb of the field. God gave us all the herbs of the field. That was written, all the herbs of the field was written in Genesis 1. That's before the fall of man. We didn't, they weren't smoking dope in the garden. You got Christians who think it's all right to smoke dope. And, you, and, and then, oh, anyway. Sorry to get drunk. Sorry to have a pint. Sorry to do that. Come on, folks. We're to come out from the world and be separate. We're to be more godlike. We're to pursue the things of God. We're not trying to be like the world. That is a fallen state. Having to get drunk. Is, it, people do that because they don't, there's an emptiness inside. Getting high, there's an emptiness inside that only God can fill. And why do you need to get high when you can get the most high? Yeah. It's a little play on word. Anyway. So if we're in the verse 6. Lord Jesus Christ, by him are all things, and we by him. How be it? There we go. Here's the, here is... Paul. Paul's established. Yeah, we understand that some of you got it, that this is offered. It don't mean anything. Because it's not going to affect me. I know there's only one God. That thing's just a statue made by the hands of man. Don't mean doodly squat to me. You can say what it was. It just doesn't matter. How be it? There is not in every one man that knowledge. For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it uh, is a thing offered unto the idol and their conscience being weak is defiled. In other words, their their, their conscience is, is condemning them because they see it as meat that's offered to an idol and they, and they, they feel like they're violating something by eating something given to a false god. But meat condemneth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. So you see, you get people who run in here, take these things up, pull them out, and go out and teach you, just do whatever you want to do. That's not what Paul's saying. Paul is establishing we understand that there are people there are people who understand that it doesn't mean anything for them to eat that meat. But there are people who don't understand that. But take heed. Verse 9, but take heed. Why do people always leave out these scriptures? <laughs> They'll pull out verse 8 and go tell everybody they can do anything they want to do and just for, act like verse 9 did not exist. It's not even in the Bible. One group got together and found them a Bible somewhere translated where 1 John 1, 9 wasn't in that Bible. And they're going to tell them, see, the, the most scholars agree. The best scholars agree that 1 John 1, 9 was not written to the church even in this Bible. They left it out. You know, that if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us for our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness because they're teaching you don't need to repent. You can't just cherry pick stuff that fits your narrative. Paul comes right behind saying that eating that meat won't hurt you and not eating that meat won't make you any better. He says, how be it? Now, how be it is an antithesis word. The thesis is we know that eating that doesn't affect us. But the antithesis is there's others who don't know that. There are Christians who don't know that. There are Christians who don't understand that. And they're looking at you. 
Hello? Take heed, lest by any means this liberty... <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> you would think by the time you got my age, my voice would stop cracking. <laughs> I'm not like I'm in perpetual, you know, that, that transition between teenage and... I'm going to live to be 100, 175, I guess. <laughs> Hallelujah. But take heed. Everybody say, take heed. What does that mean? It's a warning. Yeah, take heed. That's, dead. That's a heavy revy. We're going to put that in that sermon, deep calleth unto deep. Take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to them that are weak. Stop. Here is where Christianity really meets the road in life and in the heart of a lot of people. Your actions do have the capacity to affect in a negative way other believers. And there's a big thing now. I, know one, one, I heard one church somewhere, the men's fellowship are stogie parties. They get together and smoke big old stogies. What in the world? And, and drink beer. What in the world are you going to do to a weak believer? Well, I've got liberty. Yeah, but you're letting your liberty can very possibly become a stumbling block to a weak Christian. And who do you care about? You? Greater love hath no man than this, than he laid down his life for his friend. The imperativeness of the walk as a believer is that we are going to deny ourselves certain things not to be, become an offense to others in the body. Not, not outside the church, in the church. Now, I know you can't, you can't live completely pleasing to everybody's idea of everything. I, I know I got, um, my pastor's brother-in-law. Uh, from Greenville, down in Greenville. His brother-in-law's up in Cleveland. He's on, he's on TV, their TV station up there all the time. And he was somewhere out in public, <clears throat> and this man walked up to him, older man walked up to him and says, hey, I know you. He said, he said, yeah, he said, yeah I know you. I said, you're on TV. He says, yeah. He says, my name is, is so-and-so. And, and the guy says, no, but I, you don't understand. I know you. You're full of arrogance and pride. You may fool all those other people thinking you're some big man of God, but I know you. You're full of arrogance and pride. He said, what is it that I do? He said, you walk with your head up. A humble Christian would walk with their head down. He thought, maybe I walk with my head up so I won't run into stuff. <laughs> you know, so that, that, that's, that's just ludicrous. We can't, you can't live in that. But if your actions are going to call it, see, that person's not weak. They're, 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 they're an idiot. Did I just say that? Don't, don't. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. They were an idiot. <laughs> en français, hey, oui. <laughs> Sounds better in French, doesn't it? Say idiot. Yeah, anyway. You could just say, oh, to a bet. <laughs> He's stupid. Anyway. But let not this liberty take, uh, become a stumbling block to the end of the week. For if any man see thee, which has knowledge, sit at the meat me in the idol's temple, Shall not the Kent conscious of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which offer to idols? And th through my knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. That's pretty heavy. Paul's saying, because you know, they, they wrote the letter and they asked specifically about meat offered to idols. He said, and, and he's coming back saying, look, some of you got that. You understand that, that in Jesus Christ, there's only one God. There's no other gods. But you got weak Christians. And if they see you doing it, and their conscience is, is, you know, because they believe there's really something offered to an idol, and it violates their conscience to eat it, and they see you doing it, you're going to embolden them to violate their conscience. Now, we can take that principle a lot of places in the kingdom of God. Hello? We have got to learn that we have to prefer people above ourselves. Now, people holler grace, 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 and the love of God. They always talk about the love of God. Where's that love of God working in you? They're always saying, because they always say the love of God, the grace of God allows them to do whatever they want to do. Yet Paul said, okay, even if you're doing what you want to do, if it's affecting another believer, you're causing them to stumble. Then remember what Jesus said about causing the, the little ones to stumble? He says, bell for a millstone be tied around the neck and dropped in the ocean. And to cause one of these little ones to stumble. I'm under grace. See, you can't keep running back there. 
You can't run and hide under something when the Bible specifically addresses something in a way that you can't get around. And most people get around it by not acknowledging that it's in the Bible. Well, he was writing that to unbelievers. No, he's writing it to the church. But, verse 12, when you, listen to what he says this. Listen to what he says. Listen up. But, when ye sin so against the brethren. He said, doing what you know you get, can do because you can do it. And it causes another brother to stumble is sin. I know people don't like that word in the church. I wrote some, I read somewhere today. Somebody said, "Oh, Jesus dealt with your sin. There's just absolutely no more sin. Period." <laughs> Paul said that when your this action is a sin. What is the sin? You're not loving them. You're not preferring your brother against above yourself. You're saying, because I know it's offered to, not offered to a real idol, I can do whatever I want to do. I don't care what it, how it affects anybody else. You're in sin because you're not walking in love. The love of God, what does the Bible say? The love of God does what to us? It constrains us. The love of God is not a blanket license to do whatever you want to do. The love of God will govern your actions. So that, they are, that your actions become a blessing to others and not a sin to others. Thrilling. Listen, 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 listen to this. But when you sin so against the brother and wound their weak conscience, you, oh, you sin against Christ. All right, see y'all next week. Let's go home. Y'all enjoying that so much. Listen, I know we can preach on subjects that make you run, but this, 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 we're, we're doing this study this way. We're going through how Paul wrote it and, and, and trying to understand the circumstances and the parameters of why he wrote it, when he wrote it, who he wrote it to, what was going on. All right? Right into a carnal church, and they just think they can do whatever they want to do. And they can't do it. You can't do whatever you want to do. And see, that's what this, some, some of the new teaching in the church is. It's not really new teaching. It's old teaching they rehashed. Some people say a new revelation is just an old heresy. <laughs> a lot of times it is. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know? <clears throat> and I've said this, a lot, of the, a lot of the teaching we did on, not a lot, the, some of the excess teaching on righteousness we did back in the 70s and 80s is really what they're preaching about grace right now. The excess on grace. We, you know, I'm righteousness of God, I can't lose that, I got to stand before the Father, it doesn't matter what I do. Saying the, just using different terminology on what, what calls it, grace or righteousness. Okay? Um, and, and see, the extremes are wrong. Understand the extre extremes. I'm extremely blessed. But if you don't walk in love, you're extremely blessed. Don't work. You know? A radical grace. That's not a Bible term. We like to use terms to make something better. Let's just say what the Bible says about it. You know? I mean, you know... I'm, you might be born again to the bone, but that's not a Bible term. Just be born again. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. So, wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world stands. Let stand, lest I make my brother to be offended. Paul, <clears throat> so Paul answers a question on meat offered to us. Now, the first thing he answers it with is that it'll be evaluated verse 1 through 13, by the idol. The next chapter, he's going, he really does kind of continue in this theme. Let's go ahead. We've got a little bit more time. Chapter 9. He's going to evaluate about his freedom. In other words, I have Christian liberty, but I, I you know, I, what, what, how far? Am I not an apostle? Am, not, am I not free? <clears throat> have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? Now, Paul you know, help found that church. He says, I've seen, he said, I've seen the Lord. Now you got people today, somebody sees a vision, says they saw Jesus, people, ah, oh, nobody ain't seen Jesus. He's that. You think if Jesus could appear to the Apostle Paul, he could appear to you if he wanted to? Yeah. Now anybody, now here, here's who can do what they want to do. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And he, but 
he's not going to violate the word. If I, if I be an apostle, if I be not an apostle unto others, yea, doubtless, I am to you. In other words, Paul's saying this. Now, some people may not receive my apostleship, but I am your apostle. He's establishing his authority because they're rejecting what he's been saying in his letters. All right? And for the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. Mine answer to them that do examine me in this, have we not power to eat and drink? Have we not power to lead a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, as the Lord, uh, brethren of the Lord and Cephas? Now, Peter was married. Anyway, we know he had a mother-in-law in the gospel, so you've got to have a wife to have the mother-in-law. They go hand in hand. We even write songs about it. All right, mother-in-law, mother-in-law. All right, anyway. Or I only and Barnabas have not power to forbear working. Who goeth a, warring, a warfare against any time his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard? Who eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth the flock and eateth not the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man, or I saith not the law the same also. For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth, not God, doth God take care of for oxen? Or saith, isn't it interesting, Paul quoted the law. One well-known preacher got on television not too, sometime in the past year or whatever and said, if the can guys had just left the Old Testament out of the canon, we'd be all right. Have you ever heard, read all the guys in the New Testament who said, in the Scripture it says, you know what they were quoting? They were quoting the Old Testament and called it Scripture. What, what is it? We want to get rid of stuff. We want to get rid of stuff that doesn't support our narrative. And I'm going, to say, I'm going to say it until Jesus comes back. You do not create a narrative and then try to find Scripture to fill, uh, substantiate it. You let the Scripture create the narrative and you change accordingly. Yeah. Yeah. And if, it doesn't, if it's not what you believe, you have to change. Because the final authority is God's Word. Not what you think. Or not what you feel. Or not what some bozo on some internet blog says. Uh, or saith it all together, verse 10, for our sakes, for our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he plow should plow in hope, that, that thresheth, and he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of this hope. In other words, it's saying, you know, we should partake of the fruit of our labors. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we should reap your carnal things? In other words, finances. He's basically arguing the case that the ministry should, should be supported financially. Hello. Now, I guess we could start doing like some, you know, mu Christian musicians to start doing and charging tickets to come hear me preach. I don't know if that would work or not, you know. See, I got, she's up, and I ain't, I ain't paying to come here and preach. <laughs> ain't no way. I understand. I, I, don't, I don't like paying to go hear mu musicians. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. If we could learn all to learn to trust God, we'd be better off. Amen. Hallelujah. If others be partakers of this power over you, or we are not we rather. In other words, now what's happening is you got a bunch of people coming in there, and, and they're, they're supporting them, but they're not supporting Paul. Paul's their apostle. Paul's the one who cares for them. See, there are people who come in who only care about getting, getting money out of people, milking the church, living it up, and then, and then people, oh, he's great. I'm going to give thousands of dollars to them. Oh, he's the pastor. I, I, I mean, his car still runs. I heard it the other day, it, it, at, least, at least three of the four cylinders were still working. <laughs> Hello? Y'all here? Yeah. Hey, it's good enough for him. Hallelujah. Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should, be, we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Now, Paul's saying here, I got the right to demand it, but he hadn't been using that right because we, 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 we just don't want to be an offense to you. We want to be there to be a blessing to you. Do you, not, do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple, and they which are at the altar are partakers with the altar? Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. But I have not used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that it should be done so for unto me. For it were better for me to die than to make any, that any man should make me my glory. I'm sorry. It's better for me to die than that any man should make my glorying void. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. And I do this thing willingly. If I have a reward, but against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. What then is my reward? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel. <laughs> Come on. Hallelujah. Of Christ without charge, that I abuse not any power in the gospel. 
Now he's saying here, they've got people coming in, and they're, they're, they're accusing Paul. Oh, he's just after your money. Yeah, I haven't heard that. They're just after your money. Well, Paul said it's right that the ministry should live of the gospel. Hello? They're, they should live of the gospel. He wasn't using it because, they, because of the accusation. He was taking a step away in order to uh, discredit the accusers. But it wasn't right. He did it just so he could, he could diffuse their, their accusation. Now, I'm going to come on the other side of this. Ministers don't need to be greedy for filthy lucre. Raping the church so they can live a lifestyle that nobody else can live if they weren't getting the uh, huge money stuffed in their pocket and all thrown on the platform and all this kind of stuff. I'm not against blessing the minister. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> but I think to misuse that power is wrong. That's why, you know, that's why the Bible tells us not, like, not to ordain novices. People need to prove themselves out. People need to be mature. They need to be trained in the ministry. They need to have the right heart. Dad Hagen used to say the three G's that, that will cause you to fail in the ministry are, are the gold, the glory, and the girls. Get arrogant about who you are. Uh, get, that's the glory. Gold's the money. And the girls, that gets you in more trouble. How many of you have ever seen Jungle Book? Yeah. You know? Yeah. What's that? Stay away from them. They ain't nothing but trouble. <laughs> Blue puts it, stay away from them. They ain't nothing but trouble. I, I remember that because we just watched Jungle Book. We bought Jungle Book on Blu-ray so that when, the grand, when my kids get married and have grandkids... They can come over to Papa's house, and we're going to watch Jungle Book together, and I'll do muzzle inspections and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Up, two, three. All right, anyway. But Paul said, I have the right to this, but I haven't used it because people are making accusation against him. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made my servant unto all that I might gain the more. Remember Jesus. See, he, 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 when you understand Jesus, we, we got some stuff in the church about 20 years ago, they just, you look back over it, you get almost nauseates you. I mean, you couldn't get around the man of God because you'd mess up the anointing. Yeah. You need to spend more time with Jesus then. Because Jesus was around people and it didn't mess up the anointing. As a matter of fact, <coughs> he went to a crowd one day and everybody there just touching him, banging on him, touching him. And somebody crawls to the crowd and touches the hem of his garment and gets healed. Because Jesus knew immediately that virtue or power went out of him. Turned about in the press. Everybody had been to Disney World in the middle of the summer? It's a press. Back, especially when I, I lived in Florida uh, when I was like 69 to 70, you know, a couple of years down there in West Palm. And then we, they were building Disney World. We went back in, in the like, year 76, 77. I met Jamie in 77. We went Christmas of 77. Christmas. And, of course, you didn't have all the, you know, a lot of the extra stuff. You, know, all the, you, had, you had Magic Kingdom and Epcot. Okay, that was about it. Main Street going in. If you got separated, you ended up wherever the crowd went. That's a press. Jesus turned about in the press and said, who touched me? And, and, you know, the disciples, they're a real spiritual bunch. Boy, I'm telling you, they just walk up to Jesus and go, Master, you see the multitude thronging you, and you're asking us who touched you? Here's the, they didn't say this. We don't have this recorded in the King James. But I'm telling you, this is what they're thinking. Everybody's touching you! And he just ignored them. I know he had a Moses moment. What did I do to deserve this bunch? Okay? That's what Moses did. He went, he went out before the Lord one day and said, what did I do to you? I mean, you gave me this bunch? You gave me two million of these carnal, fleshly Christ, uh, Jews to lead out. One minute, the, they're seeing the Lord has triumphed gloriously, cast all the riders in the sea. Next minute, they're building golden calves, saying this was brought us out of Egypt. Yeah. Now it's going to take us back. Hello? So Jesus kind of ignores them, turns about in the press. What happened? Now, Jesus is being touched by all these different people who have no intention of getting anything out of him supernaturally. They're just curious. But when somebody showed up with a touch of faith, they got healed. It didn't affect the anointing a bit. But we got in this whole thing. We had ushers guarding the pastor so the anointing wouldn't be messed up. They came out of the side room before right service began and went back in right after so they wouldn't be affected by their demon spirits and all this crazy stuff. 
Are we not more spiritual? Have we not more mature? Have we not got the Holy Ghost on the inside of us that just because we just got through ministering to people, demons can't get a hold of us? Yeah. Demons are afraid of us. Yeah. Hello. We, cra we get crazy with stuff sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Looney bins. I understand if you've ministered real hard and, you, and you're tired, that's one thing. You just need to go rest because you're physically exhausted. If you ministered, if you laid hands on 3,000 people, you could be tired. That's different than this, oh, he's under the anointing. Get away from him. You got Jack Bauer standing there waiting for somebody to make the wrong move. I mean, come on. Jack is back. He made the fifth. Yes. All right. Anybody else excited? Beep, beep. All right, anyway. <laughs> yep. He said, I've made myself servant unto all that I might gain. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, <clears throat> that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law is under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without the law is without the law, not be without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak I became weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things unto all men, that I might by, means, by some means save them. Now, in other words, he, he could relate to didn't mean he acted like them. He did not go down to the temple where, where the, the goddess Diana was right. and engage in the, in the absolute debauchery that was going on down there. That's not what he was saying. Paul would come to an understanding, he, you know, he, he would come to an understanding of how they were, and he could minister on the level they understood. Didn't mean he became like them. Right. He didn't go into the hookah bar and, you know, and, and, and just smoke tobacco until he was like drunk with caffeine, I mean, nicotine. All right? He wasn't shooting up to win the heroin addict. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying become a prostitute so you can win the prostitutes. Right. Right. Okay? But he did understand the relevancy of you know, understanding where they were and being able to minister to them at the level they were. But you don't act, you don't start doing everything. Hello? I mean, can you imagine me showing up about the month from now? And, you know, I, I'm going to take a, a month sabbatical so I can come back and reach, the, you know, the, rad, the radical emo youth. And I come back tatted up with, you know, I mean, full sleeves and, you know, on the back. And I got, and I got my ears pulled down here with big weights on them with gate, you know, where they gauged it out, bolts in my face and all that kind of stuff. Now, number one, I can't pull that off. It just wouldn't work, okay? Two, they'd see right through it. They wouldn't think I was cool. They would think I was a stupid old man trying to be cool. Oh, yeah? Oh, he, 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 did you see that idiot in here today? He thought he was really happy. Now, see... Now, I may, may be understanding where they are and what's going on in their life and minister at that level, but I don't have to be them. When Paul says, I'm all things to all people, he's talking about, he, he, he understands how he, he, he finds a place so he can relate to them and minister to them without becoming them. Now, remember Jesus. How many know, Je we look at the Bible, Jesus, we know, was referred to as rabbi, rabboni. Man, he wore, and we know that the clothes he, he had on at his uh, crucifixion, the, 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 uh, the robe that he had on was one piece sewn without seams. So much so they, they bartered over it. Yeah. He wore biblical type teacher clothing. Yet he ate with publicans and sinners. In other words, he could go sit down with them to minister to them without going, <laughs> I, don't, I don't hang around people like that. No, those people need for you to go hang out with them and, and share the love of God with them without having to be like them. I don't have to go and, and, and live on the streets for six months and smell like I've been on the streets for six months to minister to somebody who's lived on the streets. That's not, my clothing and acting like them is not going to win them. The anointing is what does it. And, and willing to relate to them and to share with them and to be with them with the gospel will win them. Not my trying to look and act like and smell like them. I'll smoke some dope to share Jesus. Let me tell you something. You're going, you'll go down the hill doing that. All right. Um, verse 24. Know ye not that they which run a race, is, uh, run in a race, run all, but one must with the prize, so run that you may obtain. And every man that striveth for mastery is... Underline these next few words. Temperate in all things. 
Now they do it to obtain a you know, temperate in all things. That means you've got control. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore run, not as uncertainty, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. Verse 27. Everybody underline verse 27. Put stars beside it. I mean, if you've got a magic marker, or not a magic marker, but a highlighter, highlight it. So I keep under my body, and I bring it unto subjection. Lest, and there's a reason. See, people who tell you that it doesn't matter what you do with your body, it has no effect on anything. Well, Paul said it did. He said, if I, he said I keep it under and bring it into subjection, lest by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. And what Paul said was, now let's, let's, let's use the uh, kind of opposite statement of that. If I don't keep my body under, and I don't bring it into subjection, even after I preach to others, I will be a castaway. People who tell people that, it, that you just do whatever you want to do, it doesn't matter, that's not what Paul said. Paul didn't believe that. Paul didn't preach that. Paul didn't live that. He said, I, I'm disciplined. Now, here's, here's one thing in the church. Jesus never said go out and make converts. He said make disciples. The word disciple simply means disciplined one. Make people disciplined in the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it's not like any other religion in the world because in Christianity, you must be born again. To, be, to become a Christ, disciple of Christ, you've got to be born of Christ. You have to be born and baptized into his body by the Holy Ghost. Amen. You can't get around that. So the, you must have the right entrance. It's not a conversion to a religion. You don't start practicing Christianity and the good moral teachings of Jesus and that kind of stuff. You have to come to know him through a, what, what Jesus referred to. He says you must be born again. The new birth. Now, of course, the world starts picking that up. Everything's born again. You've got a born again this, you've got a born again marriage, you've got a born again car, you've got a born again that. And, and, and all, the, all intended to water down the biblical statement. They may not maliciously do it, but that's the spirit of the world. They're always against the things of God. Even if they're not maliciously intending that because the spirit that's operating is a spirit of disobedience, that's what it leads them to. So become a disciplined one. And Paul said that he says, I keep my body under. That's a far cry from the stuff some people are teaching that it doesn't matter what you do with your body. Yeah. If you're keeping it under, you're governing what it does. And then he said, no, do I keep it under? I bring it into subjection. I make it obey. I'm, now, see, I grew up, I was born in 58. So, you know, by the time I'm 10, I'm in the late 60s. We're now getting into the very, uh, almost to the height, the late 60s to the early 70s, the height of the hippie, anti-establishment, if it feels good, do it era. That's, how I, that's where I grew up. Our songs, you know, Ow, I feel good. You know? You know, and then, of course, if you can't be with the one you love, honey, love the one you're with. Oh, love the one you're with. <laughs> yeah, that is a commitment if I've ever heard it. Yeah, you love somebody, but you're, you're not there with them. If you can't be with them, love somebody you're with. That is the era I grew up in. And that mindset is a carnal. It's a carnal mindset. There was free love. Woods, everybody talks about Woodstock, the day a, a generation came together. That day a generation got high and had sex all over the place. Come on. Everybody looks back on Woodstock like it was some beautiful, wonderful thing. It was, I can't even use the word. It was a huge, dope-driven sex feast. That's what it was all, it was just rock and roll, getting high. Hello. Peace, man. Then I want to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony. <laughs> I'd like to teach the world to... I, mean, I remember that one. Coke picked it up and started drinking Coca-Cola while he sang it. That mindset infiltrates the church on occasion. That, that's really a spirit. It is the spirit of Antichrist. It's that, you know, and now, and now we're, we're, we're suffering today... The, the cataclysmic 
results of that kind of thinking over decades to where everybody has the right to do anything they want to do and you can't infringe upon it in any way, shape, or form. And now it's entering into the church and now the church is being told it has to accept things that the Bible teaches we can't accept. Hello? That's a far cry from what Paul said when he said, I keep my body under and bring it into subjection. And the reason is that even when I preach to others, if I don't do that, I'll be found a castaway. So ministers, if you're preaching something different than keeping your body under and keeping it in subjection, you're setting yourself up to become a castaway. I don't care if you've got 10,000 people you're preaching Christ to. Because Paul said, I'm doing it unless I myself should become a castaway. And Jesus already told him what happens if you get to heaven and say, didn't I prophesy in your name? Didn't I heal, the, heal in your name? Didn't I do this in your name? And he'll say, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Hello? But see, sometimes we don't care because well, people don't care because they got money. They got fame. They got books. They're on book signing tours. And the church is suffering because nobody's willing to tell people, you can live a life above the fray, but you're going to have to keep your body under. You're going to have to keep it in subjection. And honor the Lord with your body and your spirit, which are the Lord's. Because I'm going to tell you, there's, no, there's nothing on this planet you can find that will bring peace and satisfaction and contentment like living for God and honoring Him in the things you do. Amen. And let me tell you something, you can have fun doing it. Amen. Amen. You can have a good family life doing it. Amen. You can travel the world and see all kinds of cool things and honor and serve the Lord. But you've got to keep your body under and you've got to keep it in subjection. I need my bobblehead. I'm, I'm going to get congregational bobbleheads. I'm just going to have them sit out there and have them a little, some kind of little vibrate thing. So when I need it, I'll just press a button and everybody's head just bobbles. Yes, that's right, Pastor. <laughs> then when you're not doing I'm going to have them put the camera, because we've got the camera sessions getting ready to get set up. I'm going to put that camera on your bobblehead and let you look at you. <laughs> Agreeing. That's right. That's good, Pastor. All right. So Paul, Paul talks about his freedom, his rights there. But even in his freedom, he said, I run not as uncertainty, so fight I not as one that beateth the air. I keep my body under, bring it in subjection. Amen? Lest by any means, when I preach to others, I should be cast out and cast away. We don't want to be cast away. And Gilligan's Island was fun to watch, but it wasn't real. You don't want to be stuck on an island, spiritually. Amen?